I'm starting the recording. This meeting is being recorded. There we go. All right, excellent. So as I was saying, uh, our first speaker for this series is Peter Marsh. He's been our uh, Google Summer of Code uh, student under the IUS organization. Uh, I'll just let you introduce yourself, Peter. Uh, so you can take it away. You go ahead and you can go ahead and share your screen. I'm sure. Yeah. So let me share my screen and get this going. Um, I think Windows better. Um, all right. Let me know if you've got my screen and everything's working on your side. Yep. Yeah. Slides are loading. So it should be good, good to go. Minute. Yep, good to go. Um, all right, well, hello all, um, thanks for having me. My name is Peter Marsh, and um, I just completed my Google Summer of Code um, sort of internship with um, Rich Signal and Martin Durant as my mentors. Um, and then thank you to IUS as the host organization. Um, I've been working on a package called Kachunk, um, and Kachunk essentially allows um, access to NetCDF and group file collections um, as cloud native virtual data sets. Um, the Kachunk library provides a way to map the internal layout and chunking of various gridded scientific data sets to virtual R data sets. By creating standardized reference files, users can now directly access the compressed chunks of data contained in the original files as a single virtual data set. Um, this little drawing I've got to the left here essentially just shows all the files at, at, at the moment Kachunk can, can take in and create um, reference files for. Um, so that's HDF, HDF, which includes your know, NetCDF 3 and 4. Um, FITS files, um, TIFF, GRIB, um, normal NetCDF files, and Kachunk can actually create reference files for ZAR files, um, and there are some use cases for that. Um, and then also, I was just trying to show here that, that the purpose of Kachunk is to create the reference file. Um, when it comes to actually opening the reference file, Kachunk has nothing to do with it. Um, and it's this FSS spec um, reference file system that creates a mapper from the, um, the reference file that then is directly opened by ZAR. So once the um, reference file has been created, um, Kachunk is actually no longer needed on the user's point of view. Um, and then just a few little benefits before I jump into like a live demo of using it. Um, and the first and most obvious um, sort of use of the reference files is that it allows cloud optimized access to um, native NetCDF group two files. Um, and it, it does so by consolidating the metadata, which then allows you to um, well, and, and the byte ranges. So you can get concurrent extraction of the, the chunks through byte range requests um, rather than having to download the whole file or um, create the mapper every time you open the file, which essentially scan, it includes scanning through the file. Um, Kachunk is, uh, so then, yeah, the reference file also allows you to create analysis ready data sets. So you can create um, and standardize data sets using Kachunk. So you can combine multiple data, multiple files into a single view. Um, and you could even create different views on the same collection of files using Kachunk. Um, and another nice benefit is it's minimally disruptive. So you can keep all your existing workflows. So I think a lot of situations people have, um, you know, for NetCDF in particular, they're, they're using CDO or NCO on their existing NetCDF files. So there may be some pushback to moving completely to ZAR. Um, and Kachunk will allow you to have the, the ZAR based workflows happening alongside the existing workflows without having to duplicate data. Um, and then it's also robust in a way that, um, you know, you, using the reference file, you can, um, you can access, you can directly access the storage files. So you don't need to, you know, either create a custom API or, or, or manage any infrastructure around those APIs. Um, and from here, I will just, um, jump into showing some use cases for it. Um, so this is live ocean data. So this is from our use and they essentially run a um, high resolution ocean model. Um, I won't rerun this because it takes a few seconds. Um, well, it, maybe I will actually, it doesn't take long at all. Um, so here we're opening the, um, this, this is this live ocean reference file, which I um, just updated a few minutes ago. So now we have access to the live forecast data. Um, we just need to pass in some options here because the, um, the actual net CDF data is stored on Azure. So this is just my account name. Um, here we pass it to the FS spec um, reference file system. So here's the reference file being passed in the remote protocol and the options. Then we create a mapper, and here we are. 
here we actually open the um, data set through X-ray as if it was a ZAR file. So as far as um, X-ray is concerned, this is a ZAR file we've passed it to now. Um, so then we just quickly select the, um, the surface variables. And here I've just selected two variables. And we'll just quickly wait for this plot to render. It shouldn't take too long at all. Um, a few seconds. Maybe I shouldn't have run it. Um, and here we go. We've got two you know, nice plots to view the data. We can uh, um, and this is using whole views to view it. We can um, zoom in so if we go somewhere interesting and give it a few seconds to render. Maybe what you render. Yeah, I'll I'll come back to that little render in a second. I think that's actually on my end, not the um, access to the data end. Um, and then here we'll just um, quickly create a um, a time series. So we have here, um, I think it's about three months of data which we can directly pull. So we've just literally just selected the the temperature variable at a set longitude latitude. And we can render a time series, and here it's plotted, and that took about 50 seconds. Yeah, so about one minute to access that, that full range of data, and I think this is spread across. Um, if I go here, I can quickly check um, that data is spread across 1,600 files, which we've just accessed, you know, very easily. Um, I'll just walk through quickly creating a file. So um, if I restart this. Um, to create the reference files, all that's needed um, is fspec and kachunk. So we'll just create for a single file here. Um, here is just creating a, a, a fspec raw file system for both locally and this is for the Azure where the NetCDF files are stored. Um, and here we just access all the um, these are all the NetCDF files. There's obviously quite a few of them. Um, and if we consider here, we'll just select the um, the last file, so the latest file. Um, we just create a file opener and pass that straight to um, single HDF5 to ZAR. So that's the um, the internal kachunk or the, the, the kachunk method for creating the yeah. reference file. There's um, there's obviously a different um, version of this for different file systems. So I think the the grub one's called grub scan, and, and there's a version for ZAR and there's a version for um, FITS, etc. Um, and if we run this, you'll see it's, it's actually very quick. It takes about 10 seconds just to scan the file. Um, and once that's done, we can open up that single file as a ZAR file. So it takes about yeah, you get 10 seconds to um, create the reference, um, import X-ray. So X-ray is not actually needed to um, to create the reference. And in fact, X-ray. You know, I'm just using X-ray to 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 view it in this case, but it but it's it's entirely ZAR based. So anything that can view a ZAR file could view these reference files. Um, and then here's all our variables, etc. Um, this is what the reference file looks like inside. Um, so you can see it. It looks a lot like what your um, your attributes in, in a Z-array would look like. So here's your um, the version, the templates, um, the refs, and then you can see here. So this is for a particular variable. And instead of pointing to a file, we're actually just pointing to it to a byte range within within the NetCDF file. Um, what that means is, you, is we can modify the references. So here, um, the time variable is called ocean time, but we could actually just modify it to. So now I've, I've just done a simple string replace on this reference file, changing ocean time to time. And if we open it once again, you'll see the time variable has been changed to um, to time. So on the previous it was ocean time, and now we've just modified it to time. And and there's a there's a whole bunch of use cases you could use for that. You can you can add variables, you can delete variables, um, and you, yeah, you can make a lot of um, uh, sort of custom views on the data sets. Is is, is the use case there? Um, in this case, it's just a single um, reference file for a single file. Um, here is the script I'm using to um, update the entire live ocean. Um, 
time series or, or, or create the reference file for all the Netsia files. Um, so we just go same process. We get all the, um, the Netsia files. Here I've got just got a, a small pickle file that keeps track of the e tags because as li as Live Ocean updates, it overwrites the um, the next forecast overwrites yesterday's forecast in terms of um, today's twenty four hours is overwrites yesterday's forty eight hour. Um, so there's only set, there's only seventy two files to update each day, um, and and we we just pass this to a cluster, and. Um, in this case, I've only used 10 workers, but if I pass that to 72 workers, you know, conceivably it would, it, it would scale up easily and would, would only take 10 seconds per thing, but here it's taken 10 minutes. What is more costly is this is the our multi -Zar -to -Zar process. So this is what is joining those individual reference files into a single consolidated reference file. Um, and in this case, this takes us 10 minutes to do. Um, but this can be run in a dask tree mode, in, in which case it, it, it scales up, I think, We've got some examples going from 10 minutes to two minutes if you split it into like eight different trees and then combine those data. Um, another example I've got here is opening, um, this is the high resolution rapid refresh. So this is um, natively group two data. Um, it's available on AWS. Um, and in this case, we've put it into an intake catalog. So the, the complex steps or, or, or maybe the not so user friendly steps of needing to pass in target options and, and reference storage options um, to access the data can actually be kept within an intake catalog. And in, in that case, the user experience is a lot easier. So here we open up the, the catalog. Um, and in this case, I'm, I'm passing that catalog into an X-ray data tree. Um, so we can explore this data tree um, we can see there's 26 groups. Each group essentially looks like an X-ray data set. And what's quite cool about that is we can actually select time across all of those um, data sets just by doing a, a select across the data tree. So in this case, I've selected the same time across all the data sets. Um, we just need to do this step because Hollow Views doesn't like um, longitudes. 0 to 360, it prefers minus 180, 180. And here we can make a, um, a nice hollow views plot and we can change the change the variable and, and scroll around. And we can really explore all the variables from within it. Um, and these are all the levels. And, and I can just, I can simply, you know, to explore another level, if I was interested in high cloud layer instead of surface, I could simply just change it here and rerun these two steps. And um, I would have access to those, those variables again. Um, this shouldn't take too long at all. But what's nice about this is you can, you can access all the variables within this um, group file in one place rather easily without having to know what you want in the first case. You can actually just have the, the data set and, and explore it and, and poke around. So you can, you know, it's not just analysis ready. You, you, it's ready to explore and, and, and find out what variables are available. Um, I have one last example here. This is um, considering area five data. Um, and again, we've kept this within an intake catalog. Um, and then simply open the intake catalog. This, this catalog takes a few, in fact, takes one minute to open. And um, you might not be able to see, it's probably a bit too small on the screen share, but this is actually taking about nine gigs of memory because it is, A, it's quite a big data set. And, and, and more importantly, the, the chunking within this um, ERA5 data set is incredibly small. It's 24 by 100 by 100, which results in a very big, or, or occupying a lot of space to open the mapper, which is, is an unfortunate sort of limitation at the moment is that the uh, reference file is loaded into memory. But nevertheless, here we have access to you know, 12 terabytes of data um, in one minute, and all the variables are here. And yeah, I just made a, a simple plot so we can access them easily. Uh, and then just to show this data is accessible here, I've just quickly calculated um, you know, the El Nino, the Nino 3.4 index for this um, Euro 5 data set. So this is just considering the last you know, 10, 12 years. And just quickly making a plot in this text. This is only a single threaded. Um, I haven't passed this to a DOS cluster or anything, which could conceivably speed it up a lot. 
but here in four minutes, we've um, plotted the Nino 3.4 index and, and at no point have we had to download data or, or manage data sets or anything. It's essentially acting as if it were a ZAR data set, but this is coming from um, many different NetCDF files. Um, and I think that's about all I have to show. I think I'll, I'm happy to end it there and can continue the discussion. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, that was that was great. You, you kept uh, nicely on time as well. Um,